um, there have been folks that have been part of that, uh, the birthing of the Korea Peace Network. And I just feel like we're just getting started because this is our moment now to be starting to really organize. So I, um, I'm here to talk a little bit about our trip to South Korea and some of the reflections um, in our discussions with the South Korean women's groups. And, um, and so let me just do that. And also um, some insights, I feel like, for how we need to start shifting in this historic moment. So we, um, Nobel Women's Initiative partnered with Women Cross TMZ to bring this delegation together. And uh, we wanted to um, cross the DMZ this year. This would have been the third anniversary of the 2015 crossing. And for months, I went to the DPRK mission in the UN. Uh, we really tried our best. And um, there were two factors, one is uh, the U.S. travel ban to North Korea for Americans, and that even prevented me. North Korea is very hierarchical, so I am the leader, and if I were to bring a delegation of women across TMZ, I would need to go and sit down in Pyongyang and negotiate this, and that was not possible. I applied for the State Department exemption to the travel ban and um, got a very um, cold form letter saying that uh, women's groups meeting with women's groups in North Korea was not in the national interest. Um, <laughs> I know, it's, um, and it was a little like, not surprising, but I don't know, it just kind of hit me in a weird way. Um, so we decided, and you know, the North Koreans um, kept begging us to postpone this till after the Trump summit, that they just felt completely focused, and we didn't want to put pressure because basically the track is on, <laughs> and this is what we all want, and so, uh, we agreed to not hassle them. And so we had hoped for the last moment for a delegation of North Korean women to come to South Korea to join the international delegation. But as you know, we, we were in South Korea at a very um, turbulent time. And uh, so just quickly, we did a few things in a matter of four to five days. We started out with the Korea School and we heard from Lee Kim Hyun Suk. She's one of the advisors to the Blue House. She's been involved in the South Korean Women's Peace Movement for decades. Um, in the 1990s, she was part of the first meeting in 1991 of North and South Korean women that was brought together by Japanese women in Tokyo. And, uh, and so Lee Kim Hyun Suk gave us a great a historical overview of women from both North and South Korea engaging in the 90s and the 2000s and then the critical role that Women Cross DMZ played in 2015 in serving to bring that bridge during the real height of the frozen years of Lee myung Bak and Park geun -hye. Then we had an all day, um, uh, let's see, do I go down? Oh yeah, this is uh, Mairead McGuire, the Nobel Peace Laureate from Northern Ireland. And uh, here's uh, myself and Liz Bernstein of the Nobel Women's Initiative, who, might I add, was the organizer that uh, basically led to the landmine ban treaty. And so it's just a significant thing. I think when the, we introduced her to the South Koreans, they just kind of like bowed down to her because she's a great organizer and she's based in Ottawa and she's a great asset for our movement. And then that's An Kim jong -ae from Women Making Peace in South Korea. Uh, we had then uh, an engaged like, dialogue with um, the international de delegation and the South Korean women. And, uh, and then following that, we had a candlelight vigil in uh, Kwang Home Square. There's Medea Benjamin. Um, and uh, we, this is a stop. We did a walk then from starting with the US Embassy to the Japanese Embassy. And many of you may know that uh, the issue of the comfort women has been a huge obstacle. In fact, I just spoke at Pacific Command and the guy that introduced me um, had said, you know, the issue of women's rights is so <laughs> central to uh, the national alliances that basically the issue of the comfort women has been the huge stumbling block between uh, or among the US, Japan, and South Korea trilateral alliance. So women, we are powerful. Um, so anyway, I thought this moment, I brought this photo because um, at the Comfort Women statue, which is, you know, 
it's there, it's across the street from the Japanese embassy. Uh, the woman over there on the right is Wang Zhuang, who is um, from Shanghai and has spent a significant amount of time doing research on um, comfort women from the, both North and South Korea. And it was just powerful to hear her share some of those stories in front of the Japanese embassy. We then had a, this is impressive, an all women panel, but we had an all women <laughs> symposium. Uh, not to mention at the National Assembly, um, you know, which is their Congress. And it was hosted by the Minister of Gender Equality, um, Chan Hyung Young, Hyun Beck, sorry. And um, then we had some great dinners and discussions and, um, we then, the next, okay, so that night after, you can see the dancing, that meant that we had a bunch of soju and makari, and, um, <laughs> and so I was so exhausted because we had just like hit the ground running and spent like 14 hour days working, and so I popped two uh, melatonins so I could have a good night's sleep at 11 p.m., and at 11.30, the phone rings, and guess who it is? It's uh, one of the South Korean women, and they say, fuck, Trump canceled the summit. And we were like, Oh my God, and I was really drugged out. And I thought, holy moly, what are we gonna do? And so all of a sudden, it's like the from Kakao Talk Telegram signal, it's like all the messages are, we gotta have a protest, we gotta have a press conference. And it turns out that actually the next morning, here we are in front of the US Embassy. Uh, we actually had a meeting with the, uh, with the US Embassy at 9 a.m. And that's Ed Sigurton from the, the Charge d'Affaires of the US Embassy in Seoul. And so, that was really an interesting um, discussion. And right afterwards, um, they tweeted that they have this meeting uh, with Women Cross DMZ and the Nobel Women's Initiative, which was funny because we didn't tell them that this was happening right afterwards, which was a press conference and a protest outside of the US Embassy. And um, we got huge media attention. Uh, and it was like so perfect to be there to say, we. Women, you better talk. You better get back to the table, Trump. And, um, and it was awesome. I think every major media in South Korea and Reuters and AP covered this. So um, I think it was cru crucially important that we were there. And this is awesome. This is a Russian woman, Olga <laughs> Maltzeva, <laughs> holding up the sign to America to denuclearize. Well, Russia to denuclearize. But... Uh, um, and then we had a nice lunch with the Minister of Gender Equality. And then we, um, and then actually that afternoon, sorry, we, after the protest, we actually saw the U.S. Embassy again, um, three times in one day, at the Canadian Embassy, because they hosted us for a reception. And uh, the five ambassadors came to that reception. And the Canadian ambassador said, that is unheard of. There are so many events that they're invited to. And that was quite, I think, um, a showing of the respect of the women's peace work and um, I think an, an opportunity to, um, to influence them. So this is our DMZ Peace Walk. Uh, 1,200 South Korean women marched with us. We obviously didn't cross into North Korea, but um, we got very close to the northern side of the DMZ. We were in the civilian control zone. We actually marched for the first time on the reunification bridge. This is the first time civilians ever walked that bridge. It was built in 1998 um, during Kim Dae-jung. It was the bridge that uh, the former CEO of Hyundai brought 500 cattle across that bridge to send uh, for humanitarian aid to North Korea. And so we heard that Nomi Hyun had tried to walk that bridge, but we were the first civilians to do so. And uh, it was very moving to be um, in the DMZ again after uh, our historic crossing in 2015. So um, just some quick reflections about um, being in South Korea, um, including some of our discussions with um, the South Korean government, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, what we heard, first of all, we know there is just enormous support in South Korea for Moon Jae-in and the diplomatic overtures with North Korea and Kim Jong-un. 88% um, support in South Korea for the Pan Moon Jum Declaration. Um, what we heard from the South Korean women's groups, we need your help um, pushing for civil society exchanges. 
between North and South Korean women. Um, we need to work together across the U.S. and the United States to isolate hardliners such as Bolton to take war off the table. And um, that they see Kim Jong-un and North Korea with new eyes and that they encourage us to do the same. So um, we met with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the um, director of the Peace Bureau, and um, I know this is gonna sound so, like, really? That's not that uh, interesting, but I found it really interesting the way that he framed it to us, which was um, the North Koreans want a peace treaty, and the U.S. wants the complete verifiable, verifiable Irre irreplaceable, what is it? I always forget the Irreversible denuclearization, CVID. And um, South Korea believes that both must happen at the same time, that you're not gonna achieve one without the other. And that it really showed to me the, I mean, we know that Moon Jae-in and the Blue House has been playing this kind of mediating role, like closing the gap between Washington and Pyongyang, but it just uh, was just, great to be sitting at the table with the very people that are trying to do that. I felt that um, so much had changed from 2015 from being at the DMZ. And one was the Dorasan station, which was where, um, you know, basically that's where the train lines are going to be relinked. And um, it felt like it was actually going to be a functioning station sometime soon. And uh, when we arrived at Dorasan Station in 2015, I, I had this kind of like, like PTSD almost, uh, being at that place because that when we crossed the DMZ in 2015, that was where like 250 journalists had met us, and they were like, like hungry wolves, and we had decided that Christine On would not be anywhere at that press conference, um, and that we had this internal debate about whether I should even be anywhere visible during the peace walk because they had heard that there were um, potential acid attacks. Um, and you know, my daughter and my husband had flown from Hawaii to meet us on the other side of the DMZ. And so, you know, it was just like, that felt to me so surreal that that was potentially the feeling then, but just how extraordinary the political climate had changed in South Korea that uh, because of people's movements and social movements that led the candlelight revolution to ouster Park Geun-hye, that uh, the sea change in the politics allowed such a thing as the Panmunjom meeting to even take place. And so um, I guess my, my closing words are that uh, it's so incredible. And also to see South Korean activists who either were depressed and got ill during the 10 years of frozen relations, uh, f were forced to do other work or, or basically went underground, um, could now basically take the plans that were on the shelves, gathering dust for 10 years, to be revived. And so I feel like um, what we're gonna see in the next several years under this Moon administration is gonna be an even more powerful and organized peace movement. And so we need to mirror that and be organized and powerful here because what we know from past um, deals, whether it's the agreed framework or the breakthroughs during the Bush administration is two things. One is the opposition party in Congress that doesn't want any political progress to be made by whoever is in power, whether it's Clinton and then the Newt Gingrich uh, Republicans that blocked any progress on the agreed framework, or the hardliners within the administration. We know that uh, some of the breakthroughs during the Bush administration that Christopher Hill and Condoleezza Rice actually got through was basically hijacked by Bolton and uh, you know Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld. So we're gonna see the same thing. We need to be more organized and ready to, um, to have a more powerful base on the ground. So I, I close with that, and I actually close with one last bit of information that I think should be inspiring to everybody, which is Women Cross DMZ applied for a grant from a foundation called the Novo Fund. And the Novo Fund is 
was started by the daughter-in-law of Warren Buffett. So that means Boku Bucks. And so uh, they had a competition called the Radical Hope Fund. And 1,300 groups applied from around the world. And it was about radical ideas in this political moment. And so Women Cross DMZ applied with the Nobel Women's Initiative and WILF. And we got to the final round. And just a few weeks ago, we heard that we got one of the treasure, treasure <laughs> um, grants to start a women-led peace treaty campaign. So we got $2 million. <laughs> to launch a women-led peace treaty campaign. So it's hugely exciting. It means I'll get even less sleep. Uh, but I feel like there, it's, there's infrastructure now, and we have a backbone to move us forward. So anyway, just those are some comments, and let's work together. We have a lot of work to do. Thanks. <laughs>